I'm Igor Kuznetsov. Uh, well, I changed my name. Uh, I was recently Igor Sumikov, so you may know me by that name. I work for Kaspersky for about 19 years, and I'm a principal security researcher in the GRAY team. I started my job as a virus analyst. I was analyzing the old school viruses, and then there were worms and trojans, and then the APTs came, and I was lucky to analyze all of those, and the, the most interesting, the most notorious of those. I tried to read them all apart, and well, I gained some experience in that. And this is what I usually do at work. And when I don't, I make some tools to make my life easier. And when I don't do that, I teach malware analysis. Uh, we do have a two-day training at SAS, and I hope we are going to have one this year, although it was rescheduled. And this talk is loosely based on the first introductory exercise of what we actually have at the SAS training. And at the beginning of every training, I give this boring disclaimer, but please pay attention to that, is there is no single right or correct way to do reversing. It's okay if something that I do speak about doesn't work for you and vice versa. Well, it's all subjective. There is no ultimate best tool for the job. It's normal. And we're going to discuss several of those tools and please don't be offended if I just missed some names or didn't like some tool. Well, it's okay. It's just it didn't uh, go well with me. It may work uh, well for you. Well, and we are having uh, just a one hour talk. It's very hard to get a lot of information in one hour. Uh, we're going to have uh, screenshots of the most important parts of the analysis but I really hope that you will use this talk just as a guide for self-study. And if you are interested in learning more, please just practice a lot. And if you do want, you are more than welcome to join us at SAS for a two-day training. Now, let's settle on a few definitions. Uh, what's actually static analysis? It's when you analyze the program, but you don't execute it. It's very important. So if you use a debugger, you step in the code, it's not static analysis. It's called dynamic analysis. We're not going to talk about that. So for the static analysis, we use the tools that look into the file. The first and obvious are just viewers, like hex viewers, binary editors. Uh, any kind of hex editor will work. Uh, he will work, sure. Hex edit, O and O, AJXT, uh, whatever fits. Then there are disassemblers, the main instrument that we use. And then going one level higher, there, there are decompilers, uh, IDA, Hex, uh, Hex Trace, Kidra has a free decompiler that now is imported in Radar, and I'm sure a lot of tools will use that. Well, those are the tools, and well, the the most important part is that you spend a lot of time using these tools. And uh, it, it really takes much more effort uh, than just firing up your sample in a sandbox and taking a look at the logs. Then why would you bother doing that? I have some suggestions. Uh, first of all is that the static analysis is much more comprehensive because you are not just observing a program being executed somewhere you are actually looking at the code. Uh, then you have no dependencies. For example, you may have code for some exotic architecture or an embedded platform or an ATM and you have uh, some DLLs missing and you just can't run the program. But it's not a problem if you're doing static analysis. And of course, if you don't need that uh, much resources for executing the program. You can scale your analysis in very many aspects. And of course, and it's very important, is that you can save the results of all your work. You can save the IDA database, you can save a Gidra project, uh, you can just even save a text file. And it can stay there for five years until you get a new version of a program. You just go back to your results and all your memory is refreshed. 
and this is very important. And of course, you can just share your results with the community, with your colleagues, you can work collaboratively, and it adds a lot to your work. Okay, enough talking, let's just go to practice. Uh, We're going to look at one sample. Again, it's just based on the first introductory sample from the training. And this sample is a very humble little Metasploit reverse HTTP shell. Why this? Well, there are several, several reasons. Uh, first of all, it's an actual uh, sample that we use in the exercise. And it's, it has so many different levels uh, inside if you analyze it thoroughly. And it's available on GitHub. So you can just grab the sample, you can install Metasploit, generate your own shell code, and you get the sample. So you can reproduce all the research that I'm talking about. And I feel that it's very important that you can reproduce all the steps yourself. Because, well, we can't spend a lot of time doing it right now. I hope you will do it yourself sometime later. Now, let's just take one reverse HTTP or HTTPS shell, generate it, save in a file, and well, we'll work with that file. I've prepared a checklist of what you may want to know uh, before you start your analysis. Well, the, the first, uh, it's very important that you have some context. Uh, in real life, for this kind of shell code, you will have some results of an incident response or a memory dump. Uh, or another binary loading the shell code. So you will know that most likely it's a Windows 32-bit uh, process uh, being executed on an Intel machine. So you have all that context that already gives a lot of information. Then you may have some validation points. And by the, these, I mean uh, some prior information about the behavior of the program. Uh, for example, if you just grab the sample from incident response, and the infected machine was beaming uh, to a C2, and you have the name or the IP address, you will be looking for that information inside the sample. And if you are, don't have that information, you are obviously missing something. So this will help make your research complete. Uh, you do need uh, to have some basic knowledge about the layout of what you are looking into. Uh, if it's an exe file or an RTF document or just a shell code. And you do need to be able to recognize, for example, how the code looks like for the target architecture. If you are looking even just with the text viewer in the shell code and you have ex some experience, you will easily recognize uh, that, well, this is an Intel shell, uh, Intel code. And it's very easy to see it if it's 32-bit or 64-bit. Things like that come with experience and it's uh, always useful to have that. And also very useful to have at least some basic knowledge about the target operating system. For example, with Windows, you have these API names uh, like uh, write process memory or create remote thread or connect. And if you find these names in the sample, you immediately know that there is something worth inspecting. Okay, so you have that information. Uh, you would like to analyze the file. What do you start with? Uh, usually you don't start the disassembler from, from and load the file in the disassembler. Uh, first, you just look at the file. You take a viewer, you take hue or hex edit, and just make initial assessment of what is inside of it and what you would be wanting to extract is, is there a known format? Is it a P file? Is it a Metro file, an ELF file? Uh, is it packed with UPX or any other known packer or protector? Are there clear text strings or are there strings that are definitely encrypted? Are there a big high entropy buffers that may indicate there is a payload or a VFS that you will need to decrypt at one moment? Is there an embedded executable or another shell code? If there are some big encrypted or packed files, it may indicate that instead of loading the file in the disassembler, you will first need to unpack it, maybe even dynamically. 
So this may indicate that there is some additional work. But well, we have a shell code. We do know that there is nothing like that. We Okay, just uh, take a few seconds to look at the dump. I'm using just hex dump, and this is a screenshot of my terminal. Uh, well, in Linux, you can install hex edit and uh, use hex dump or xxd. Well, whatever works for you is okay. Just take a look, see what's in there, and let's make a very, very short summary. Well, it's a shellcode, obviously, and uh, not only because we do know that it's a shellcode, but uh, also because there are some very specific things that you usually find in a shellcode. For example, you would see some short jumps, like EB something opcodes, and uh, very short relative calls, E8, and a very little little, uh, little Indian number. Uh, sometimes it will be just E8 and four zeros. And you have that E8 and very little number in the beginning. We have readable ASCII strings. Well, OK, I think it's enough for us uh, to understand that, well, it's code. There is nothing to decrypt. Uh, yes, it's a meta exploit because Kostian. Uh, so let's use all that information to load this sample correctly in the disassembler. Now we move on to using the primary tool that is, in our case, will be Ghidra or Ida. And before that, I also have a checklist. Of course, you can't just use a disassembler if you don't know the target assembly language. Uh, you do know, uh, you, you need to know at least the basics of the language. Uh, even if you are not familiar with the exact architecture you're looking at, it's always good if you know several assembly languages. Uh, many instructions look alike and have similar names, so it's okay. But you do need to know uh, what are the registers, uh, what's the stack, how it works on your target architecture, how is memory addressed. Well, for Windows, uh, it's simple. You have linear memory addressing, but you still uh, need to know that. Uh, you do need to have information how the code interacts with the operating system. Uh, for Windows, it will be calling the API functions uh, in the DLLs, and it, there will be a completely different story if it's a kernel driver. Uh, for Linux, you may have interrupts for syscalls or also calls to libc, uh, dynamically linked one. It's always good to have the documentation on the APIs of the operating system. It's really wonderful that you can download uh, the MSDN docs in Markdown. Uh, there is a GitHub called Microsoft Docs, uh, and there are man pages uh, for Linux and PSD and other Unixes, obviously. It's good to have those at hand. And, well, if the language that was used to create the program is a high-level one, it's good to know, uh, well, at least some rough understanding. Uh, what's in the language? What are the features? Yeah, uh, for example, for Go, you do need to know that most of the functions have several return values. And those are usually passed by reference. Uh, and they look like variables. Uh, but it, you do need to keep that uh, in your mind when analyzing. and just understanding that one of the variables will be one result and the other will keep the other one, and there is completely different meaning for these variables. Okay, so what do we usually use to disassemble? The most obvious choice will be IDA Pro. Well, it's the most feature-like, uh, feature-rich, uh, the best tool on the market, but, well, you know, uh, it's the most expensive tool on the market. So if you don't have that kind of money to buy IDA Pro, you will use something else. Uh, there is IDA Free, that is a very, very limited version. And recently they announced IDA Home, that is also limited, but much cheaper. There is Binary Ninja, that is simpler and cheaper. And there is Ghidra. 
NSC released Gitra about a year ago, and it's free and open source. Well, it's written in Java. It's kind of a trade-off uh, because you will have to program in Java. And it's not as good as either. It, it doesn't have that much feature, but well, it's open source. If so, if you don't have that feature, you can code it, right? Also, there's Raider too that is out there for a longer time than Gidra, and it's open source, and it looks like GDB text mode. Uh, and recently, well, for some years, there is a GUI called Cutter. It's kind of a very, very simple idea-like GUI that simplifies things, but it's, it's not that feature-rich as Ghidra, for example. So that, that is why uh, I will be using Ghidra and Ida. Ida. Uh, and well, the rest is up to you. You can try all the tools and uh, figure out yourself what's best for you. And yes, Mr. Korsin, I tried to use Ghidra for several weeks uh, exactly to get ready for this talk. So I'll be showing some screenshots of me working in Ghidra. Let's load the file. Uh, for IDA Pro, it's very straightforward. You can load only one file in your one workspace. Uh, you have this concept of loaders. Basically, there's a format detection tools, uh, plugins. Uh, in our case, it's just a binary file. So we just load it with the default options. Uh, IDA assumes it's Intel 32-bit. Uh, so you just load it and you end up with this layout of data and partly disassembled code. And th this is it. As for Ghidra, it's, it's very different. Ghidra is based uh, around the concept of projects that, that are workspaces for analyzing several files at the same time. And also for collaborative work, they even have this uh, server for uh, storing all the data on the server and working collaboratively. Uh, by the way, that's what is missing in IDA Pro. So to load your file in Gitra, you do need to create a new project and then you import that file into the project. And then you use a tool called Code Browser to actually open the GUI that looks like IDA Pro. And Kidra, in our case, doesn't make any assumptions about the format, so you do need to specify the format yourselves. Uh, and the format and CPU and architecture, it, all, all that together is called a language in Ghidra. So you do select a language that is a combination of x86, uh, default calling convention, uh, better just to select a preset that is called Visual Studio and it will work. Now you end up in a very, very similar view with the listing. Uh, no disassembly here. Uh, Kidra has some options that will allow to guess that there is some code or data, but basically you end up with just data in there. As you see, Ida acts more smart uh, and try to guess where the code is. And Kidra didn't. If you didn't use the aggressive instruction finder tool, and well, anyway, both of the tools fail to recognize all the code. Well, this is the whole concept of interactive disassembly. Uh, the tools are very good, but still they are not that smart as you. So you need to help the tools to understand what's, what's in there, what's in the file. And you do need to get familiar with the concept of removing disassembly and removing the data marks, and then forcing your tool to either disassemble or decode the information as data. In IDA, it's, these functions are called undefined for removing the analysis and then edit code, edit data. And for Kidra, it, it's very funny that the shortcut for undefining or clearing is C, that is create code in IDA, so please don't be confused. Uh, if you are going to use both tools, I suggest uh, that you change all the shortcuts uh, to some common denominator. Otherwise, it will all go crazy. And there are commands for disassemble and data, and basically you get the same results in, as in IDA. 
Now that you applied the code, you get this listing. Uh, just let's start looking at the code. Uh, the first instruction is CLE. We just skip it for now. It's not relevant. And then uh, there's a call. And now we encounter another feature of both these assemblers. And well, it, it may sound pretty lame, but it's very important. It's going by references. So we double click or press enter on, a, on any item like a function, a variable, a label, and we go in there in that location. And then we use a shortcut uh, like escape in IDA or alt left in Kidra and we go back and we go back and forth uh, a lot of uh, times and we spend, well, hours going back and forth just to figure out what, what's happening in the code. And what is very important to look at is cross references. They are called XREFs. Uh, usually these are back references. Uh, this is a way for the tools to indicate uh, that there is some code or data uh, that references your object. For example, uh, if it's a function, you can find all the places that are calling this function. Let's just go into this function and take a look at the disassembly and start analyzing it. Okay, I'm, I'll be mixing these screenshots of Ida and Ghidra because, well, mostly they're very similar and it's always good just to see how it looks in both of the tools, right? We have this function. This is the first function called, and we take a look at the first instruction and it's both EBP and there are several pushes and then call EBP. We take a look at call EBP and it's important uh, because, well, the code is invoking some other function, but we don't know which one yet. Another feature is tracking the data flow. It's, for registers, it's more complicated uh, than for variables because there are no cross-references. But there is a neat uh, feature in both of the tools. It's uh, highlighting the registers. In either you just click on the register or any other object, and it will highlight the same object in the listing. And in Ghidra, it's not that obvious. Uh, you just click, middle click the object. Of course, you can reassign this shortcut, as it turns out, and uh, Kidra can also react uh, by highlighting just to a single click. It's okay. Okay, so if you just highlight EBP, you will see that it is overwritten by popping the value from stack. Here is when you do need to know how stack works, how registers work, how call works. And it's very important to not forget that many instructions modify the data indirectly. For example, the call pushes a value on top of the stack and it will be the return address, basically the address after the call function. And our pop EBP will retrieve exactly that value. We get that address and we're calling it. That means that the instruction after the first call that we have seen is the beginning of the function. So now we go back, we navigate back to the beginning of the listing and take a look at what's happening in there. And the first thing that we'd like to do is create a function in there. We know that this is a piece of code that it is being invoked by a call but since the call is kind of indirect, uh, both the of the tools didn't recognize it automatically. So you do need to create a function. Now that you have done it, uh, you will see that uh, the tool will do a very neat thing for you. It will recognize stack access and recognize the stack variables. And now that you have those, you can rename it, you can do whatever you want with them. And what is more important is that you have cross references to, to these variables and it will make your life much easier. Okay, let's analyze the actual code of the function. Uh, we see that there's some saving of the registers, then setting up the stack frame, and then reading by FS plus 30. Now, this is something first just uh, to remember, or if you don't know, uh, you Google it, and then remember is that on Windows 32-bit, FS register points to a thread information block and at offset 30, you have a pointer to a structure called PEB or the program environment block. 
And this is something you are going to encounter frequently for custom loaders, uh, PE loaders. So this is something to remember. And as you can see, the further the code reads the data from that structure and then uses that data as a pointer to some other structure. So if we don't figure out what are the fields within the structures, what is their meaning, uh, we can't really understand what's happening in the code. So we do need to use information about the structures somehow. How do we do that? Well, as I said, this is a very neat little sample that uh, involves so many levels of analysis. And this is probably one of the most important things that uh, we use every day in modern, modern reversing, especially with C++ code, is the information about structures. Because in modern programming, if you have a compound object and it's not a string, it's most likely a structure. And if it is not, it can be emulated by a structure. Everyone loves structures. Every API will take either just a basic type of data or a structure. And any instance of a C++ class is a structure. So you need to get familiar with the concept of the structures. And if you apply this information about the structures and use it in a decompiler, you can get really fantastic output. It can be very nice and readable and sometimes even better than the original code. Okay, so how do we apply this structure information? Your tool needs to know about the structure itself and about the layout, about the fields to be able to use this structure. Well, the good news is that both IDA Pro and Ghidra have built-in type libraries that are shipped with the products and they contain information about the most popular structures. In IDA, there are several different places uh, where you have to go inside the GUI to get your structure. Uh, and all of those are called subviews. So they're all located in the view menu. You first have to go to type libraries and load the type library that is basically an archive of types. And in our case, the type library is called NTAPI. Then when you have loaded the type library, it's not enough. You have to go to another subview called structures and then add structures by names from the standard list of structures that is basically your type library into this subview. And only then you can use this structure. And you have to do this operation for every structure that you need. Well, yes, it's a bit inconvenient. Okay, what about Ghidra? It does have a window called Data Type Manager and they have standard archives that are basically the type libraries shipped with Ghidra. And there is one for Windows 32-bit, another one for 64-bit, some for OS X. Uh, and if you load this type library, you will get some Windows types. The problem is that there will be no PB there, just none. And uh, this is not the only structure that is missing. For example, the virtual tables for comma objects for bits and other types are just not there. How do you get that information in Ghidra? Well, there's a fix for that. And not only for Ghidra, but also for IDA, because, well, you won't always analyze just the standard Windows structure, you may need something else. And to import that information in both tools, will use the best universal transport describing the structures. And these are just C header files. And both of the tools can import the header files and produce some internal information about the structure that you can use. For either pro, you find this parse the header file command and it will import type information just in the current database. And if it, that's not enough, you can use a different standalone command line tool called tlib and it will produce uh, a type library file that you can reuse then. For Ghidra, it's a bit easier 
there is a command called uh, parse source, and there are some options inside, and there are presets for compilers like Visual Studio, and it will produce ju just a type larvae that you can reuse. And yes, you have to do this. You have to download the Windows SDK or the library that you need, and you have to get the headers for the language and you do need to play with the options until you get it compiled. But believe me, it's worth it. What worked for me, just in case uh, you have any problems with Ghidra, is this uh, set of options. I took the preset inside uh, of Ghidra for Visual Studio 2012. Uh, I took the includes for the runtime library of Visual Studio. I took the SDK 7.1a and just modified the path to the include directories and imported the header files Windows and Winternal and saved it and it was enough to get PB and all the related structures inside Ghidra. And later I was able to reuse it in other projects. Now that we have all this type of information, how do we apply it in the listing? Uh, in IDA Pro, it's called structure offset. You just point at the operand and you click the structure offset command and you select the right name of the structure and you get this nice readable name instead of a number. Okay, we apply it to the first operand. We see there's a ne next instruction also dereferencing another structure, but we don't know the type yet. So how do we find it out? Uh, we use references. You, you we use our LDR name, we double click on the LDR name, and we end up in the structure sub view. And there we will use the command edit type, and we see the type of the field, and that is PPB LDR data. We, well, what we would want to do then is go to the structures and add another structure by this type. The problem is there is no such type. Okay, what do we do next? Uh, there's another subview in IDA, it's called local types. It's kind of a viewer of the type library that you loaded, but not the types that you have imported in the structures window. And it's better than just the, the information about the types because it also contains uh, information about the type definitions. There you can find this PPB LDR data and find out that it is a type def of a pointer to a structure called PBLDR data. And this is a name that uh, you would use to find the structure and then synchronize to the IDB to copy that structure. So it takes some effort to do it. Now, how do you do that in Ghidra? The short answer is we don't. Uh, Ghidra doesn't have this concept of field offsets. So we cannot get these nice readable names in the disassembly listing. Uh, frankly, it's very easily implementable. Uh, I don't know Java much, but I did it in half a day and it worked for me. But well, uh, there is another thing in Ghidra, it's the decompiler. And you can use all that type information in the decompiler. You can just retype the variable that is a pointer to a structure and tell Ghidra that it is actually a pointer to a structure and name that structure. And if you do that, you will get a very nice readable output. Okay, another reference, another data. You have that F-link and it's a member of a very specific window structure that is ahead of a linked list. Uh, the concept of a linked list is you place this head inside a bigger structure and then use this forward pointer or F-links to iterate over a list. But the problem is that this pointer, this F-link, is not pointing to get the beginning of the function, uh, of the structure, but to some member inside of it. So if this pointer is then used to read some data from the bigger structure, uh, there is a shift, there is a difference between the offset of the field in the whole structure and the offset in the listing. So how do you tell your tool that there's a difference? Well, 
Gitra doesn't have support for that. So if you do need to get the right names, you need to work around. You need to copy structure, remove the fields uh, to make up for this delta for this difference, and then apply that structure. As for IDA, it does have this concept of shifted pointers, but it's kind of hidden. You have to select the operand and then apply struct offset command. And in that case, you get a completely different window where you can input the delta and it will work. And in hex rays, uh, you have a special type modifier uh, that's named double underscore shifted, where you can also tell hex rays that there's a different type if you shift your pointer some, in our case, eight bytes back, and you will get a nice readable name. I suggest that you take some time and apply all this structure offsets to the rest of the function. And uh, if you just need uh, some tips, uh, the DLL base field within that LDR data, data table entry is the pointer to the beginning of the image of the DLL image. And that is image does header. Uh, this is the name of the structures that you will be looking for. And that header in turn, will have the offset of the P header, and the name for the structure is image in T headers. And well, from that, uh, you get a pointer to the first directory within the PE, th that will be the expert directory. And obviously the name for the structure is image expert directory. Well, it you will need to spend some time to do it, but I suggest that you actually go through all the steps. And to be, to feel uh, good with uh, doing all of that, you really need to get familiar with the concepts of the MZP formats. Uh, what is a P relative virtual address? Virtual address. Uh, what are the relations? And well, when you do spend some time, you will get this nice readable listing. Uh, it's funny that both of the decompilers make some errors in naming the fields. Uh, and almo almost similar errors, but you can see that well, the code is just going over the names in the expert directory, then hashing every name and checking if the name matches the argument. And if it does, it will just jump to the address. So it will resolve an API by the hash and then just jump to the function. We usually call it get API by hash. And in our case, it's a very famous function. It's raw 13 hashing function. Well, and if you finish analyzing this function and go back to the rest of the code, you will see that the, the rest of the shell code is just calling this function with different hash values. So it's jumping to APIs. And if you don't resolve these API hashes to names, you just don't know what's happening in there. How do you solve this problem? Well, the obvious solution is to pre-calculate the hashes of all the known API names and then go through the whole listing. And if you encounter an operand within an instruction that is matching your pre-calculated hash, it makes sense to, for example, put a comment on the side that, well, this is a hash for, for example, create file A. How do you do that? Well, it's pretty obvious. You write some code. So this is what you will do. If you think that the tools are enough, well, they, are, they aren't. One day or another, you're going to do it. Again, a checklist. If you know Python, it's OK. Most people prefer Python. Uh, frankly, I think that it's not enough because the native language of IDA Pro is C++ and the native language of Git is Java, and it's better to use the native API. It also helps if you try to create your own little toy disassembly tool, for example, taking the open source Capstone framework and trying to analyze the file with your program. You will understand a lot of inner workings and 
solutions that are implemented in the tools that you use. It's also very important to understand how to translate the bitwise operations that usually happen in encryption and protection and hashing like SOAR, ROAR, ROLL in the language you are using to program the tools to translate from assembly to C++ or Java or Python. Sometimes you will even need to decode the opcodes yourself. So you may need to know at least roughly how to deconstruct the machine code into well, some kind of representation that you understand and your programmers understand. Okay, so let's try creating a plugin for both tools. Ida calls them plugins and they are just lo uh, dynamically loaded libraries or so files or daily files. And also there are Python bindings, but I still strongly suggest that you use the native interface. And Kidra calls these plugin scripts, and they're actually uh, scripts, text files written in Java. And there is a native Java API. And since the whole tool is open source, you can use this source to create more advanced plugins. There is also a way to execute Python code via Jiton. Well, didn't try that. So you can try it yourself. And it's also very important that both tools have a lot of examples shipped with them. And it's also very good just to take one tool, uh, see how it works, try to modify it, try to make little changes, and this is how to start. So our tool is going to do a very simple thing. We take a list of API names, we calculate the hashes for the names, and then we go through the whole listing and check if there is an operand that matches the hash. If it matches, we put a comment. Is it that complicated to do it in, in the tools? Well, for either plugin, it took me about 124 lines with comments. Uh, of course, you need the Visual Studio compiler, you need the IDA SDK. Well, as you, well, you don't need to try to read all the code. It didn't fit in there. It's open source. I've put it on GitHub anyway. But well, it, it's really simple. And uh, the implementation details are also very simple. You, you just implement the main function called run. There are also additional functions that you don't really need to implement. Uh, you go all the decoded addresses with a function called next editor, and you check if the address is marked as code. Remember, you, we have done this marking yourself. And then you decode the instruction with this decode instruction, uh, decode in and SN function, and you parse the operands. The rest is, is very simple. And then you just compile it, uh, put the DLL or so or dialib in the IDA plugins directory, reload IDA, and you have a new menu item in the edit plugins and just launch it. Uh, as for Ghidra, you copy the Java file, you don't need to compile it, you copy it to Ghidra features space Ghidra scripts. It took me about 85 lines. Uh, well, supposedly there are less comments in there. And you just copy the file, uh, you don't need to compile it because Gitter will compile it for you and it will complain if there are syntax errors. And you open the window called script manager and you just search for this, your script by the file name and you start it from there. And the implementation details are also pretty simple. There is also a function called run. You implement it in a class you inherited from Gitter script. And you have several iterators. You have an iterator for listing and then use it to get all the instructions. And then you go over all instructions. And well, that's it. it it's very amusing that both tools are based on, on the same concepts. These are just addresses, instructions, data types, functions, and, and references, all kinds of references. So if you are familiar with one tool, you will most likely have no problems writing uh, any kind of code for another one. And the last step that we need is just to prepare, prepare some data. We need the API names. Uh, we can just grab the names from the expert directory. For example, in Windows, you can use dump bin from Visual Studio, or you can just take opt dump from any kind of Unix distribution and just save it to a file, fit it to your script, 
and it will work. Now, a little set of screenshots how it works. So you find your script by the name, you execute it, and you have these nice names. And now is the moment when you can actually analyze the rest of the code. And the same thing happens in IDA Pro. You load this new plugin and you get the names. Now you can analyze it. Both source code for the plugins are on GitHub. Uh, you are free to do anything with the code. You just download it. You can copy it, compile, modify. I hope that you will find it useful. I suggest that you take the docs and the headers for the APIs for the tools that you are using. Uh, they are all very well documented. And just take your working plugin, modify it, and I hope that you will get tools for your use. Now, uh, when you excel at all of that, uh, I have some suggestion what you can study then. Uh, first of all, some new architectures. If you know Intel, why not ARM or MIPS or whatever, and uh, better just try to create a little program, even just a hello world, to get a feeling how that assembly works. Uh, try to parse the well-known binary formats yourself. Just take a PE file or L4, Match or all of them and create a parser with your code, not just importing someone else's code. And on top of that, just take a disassembler and try to create a framework. And I hope that it will help in your analysis. Well, as for me, I do have my own parsers and the framework. And actually, I'm showing part of that on the training. And I show why exactly it's very useful to have your own tools for analyzing the code. Then there is a huge area that is C++ classes. They are very hard to analyze. You have to recreate a lot of structures or create tools to recreate the structures. And then there are function signatures. There are flare signatures for IDA or, well, function ID in Gitra. So to make the tools recognize well-known libraries, you need to compile these libraries with very precise understanding what are the compile options. And you need a lot of practice with that. So this is something definitely to try. And very important, learn all the shortcuts. They speed up your analysis considerably. And if you are using both tools, well, make the shortcuts similar. It, it will help a lot. Here are some links. Uh, well, I hope you all know where to get IDA or Ghidra or Metasploit. Uh, there is also a link uh, to my API hashes plugins that are created specifically for this talk. Uh, just let me know if you find them useful or need something else that may be worth publishing on GitHub. If you're hiring a junior reverse engineer, what questions would you ask them? What skills would be more important to you? I guess the question from junior reversers is, if I'm going into a job interview, what should I pay attention to to showcase in the job interview? Well, uh, well, I do sometimes participate in real hiring process. Uh, nowadays, it's not about juniors, so sorry, I don't have that first-hand experience. Uh, but I'd say that the most important things that we are looking at is the ability to learn. And uh, well, the eagerness to learn is very important. Uh, if someone is interested in reverse engineering, I expect that person to do reversing at home, not just for work. And maybe even just trying to find some Easter eggs in a binary, or, you know, it may sound uh, not so legitimate, but even looking at the key gener generation algorithm for a license, it, is, it shows a curiosity. And this is very important to be curious and to be able to learn. For someone who's taking your course already, what material do you recommend going forward? Like what other books or courses that I can do after I've done this? 
Well, uh, I can't recommend any book. Uh, maybe I'm too deformed in, in a professional way. Uh, but I suggest that you take the most complicated APTs. Some of them are, well, out there, open source, basically, and try to analyze them in depth. This is something very few people do. Uh, usually we just go on, on the higher level because there is so much in there. But if you try to get to the deepest insight of these complicated frameworks, this is the best knowledge and the best experience that you can get. Can you recommend a special technique for working with intersecting instructions in obfuscated code? Well, it's complicated and it's usually very specific to some particular cases, but we usually end up writing our own tools on top of IDA and also on top of hex trace using the microcode. Is it possible that this training can be delivered online or is this something that can only be done in person? There's some, just some questions from folks coming in trying to figure out if that's an, op an option moving forward if they can't get to a physical place. Well, what I'm sure is uh, at this moment, uh, there is not enough material prepared for online training because it's a completely different media. I'm not sure if we are going to make a virtual training or not. Uh, well, theoretically, it is possible, but we don't have that material right now.